Thanks, Jen. And also, uh, thank you, uh, Ryan, who you can't see, uh, who is our IT guy. Uh, this is my first webinar. And um, so if I have any uh, te technical issues, uh, Ryan will be sure to jump in and correct them for me. Uh, yeah, my name is John Nolan. I'm one of the uh, joint replacement surgeons at Mercer Bucks Orthopedics. Uh, this is my CV. I went to Jefferson, uh, did a residency and some post-residency training in Philadelphia. And these are some of the things that I've done over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, basically, I'm a general orthopedic surgeon who has evolved into primarily a knee surgeon, uh, also some hip and shoulder surgery. Uh, this talk is about the treatment of knee pain. So one of the first things that we generally have to do when we're evaluating somebody for knee pain is realize that not all knee pain comes from the knee. Uh, a couple examples of things that we need to be aware of. Sometimes hip pain can be referred to the knee. Uh, sometimes something like sciatica, uh, where the pain goes down the leg, can be most painful in the knee. So we, we not uncommonly get somebody re referred in for knee pain and they may have an MRI of the knee that shows that there's a small cartilage tear or something, which is a irrelevant uh, fact because really their problem is somewhere else. So not everything that hurts in the knee necessarily comes from the knee. Of the problems that come primarily from the knee, there are several, uh, breaking them into a few broad categories, uh, bursitis, tendonitis, uh, instability or ligament injuries, uh, torn meniscus, uh, infection, chondromalacia, and arthritis. Uh, I didn't include tumors or fractures because I'm not really going to talk about either of those during this talk. So probably the most common cause of knee pain in our office is something called chondromalacia, or some people refer to it as patellofemoral syndrome. And basically, it's pain that occurs between the kneecap and the femur, the front of the femur, and it's classically, uh, the history is my knee hurts when I get up and down out of a chair or when I'm going up and down stairs. Uh, when you're standing straight, the weight on your body goes from the femur to the tibia and the kneecap really isn't involved. Uh, but when you're bending your knee and putting weight, such as getting out of a chair, the weight goes through the kneecap and then is compressed against the femur. So it's a fairly common problem it's the most common problem we see, a little bit more common in females than males. And fortunately, it's very easy to treat, generally with some exercises that we give people, occasionally a cortisone injection, uh, almost never surgical in nature. Uh, and again, that's, that's one of the more frequent things that we see. Another fairly common problem in the knee is called bursitis. Uh, bursitis means inflammation of the bursa. And there are a number of bursts around the knee. Uh, many of you, any of you played sports when you're younger or different occupations. Uh, the term water on the knee uh, refers to a subcutaneous prepatellar bursitis. Uh, basically, it's fluid that forms in the sac. Uh, it may not be painful, uh, and it doesn't even necessarily require treatment, uh, but some people don't like the way it looks or it can be uncomfortable. Uh, generally, the treatment is number one, reassurance. Tell people this is not cancer, this is nothing you need to worry about. And then number two, we might aspirate the fluid. Sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes we need to aspirate it a couple times, maybe in conjunction with the cortisone injection. Occasionally, if it's bothersome enough, uh, we will remove the bursa. It's not really a, a big deal. Uh, again, generally, this is not something that absolutely needs to be treated, but if people are uncomfortable, uh, it's very easy to treat that way. Another common malady in the knee is tendonitis, which again refers to inflammation of the tendon. Uh, the two most common are in the quadriceps, which is just above the kneecap, and the patellar tendon, which is just below the kneecap. Uh, again, this is generally pain when you're flexing or extending your knees, when you're trying to get up out of a chair, but instead of being uh, deep in the knee, it's a little bit more superficial. And again, fortunately, this is almost never a surgical problem. Uh, some type of a simple brace like a chopad strap, which goes around the patella, right underneath the patella is oftentimes uh, frequently effective. Again, almost all knee problems, uh, the initial treatment is to have somebody do some knee conditioning exercises. What I like to do is send people to a physical therapist 
uh, you know, once or maybe twice just to review some exercises, make sure they're doing it correctly, and then they do it on their own for four to six weeks. Uh, as opposed to the chondromalacia, this is one area where we can't inject. Uh, injecting into the patellar tendon or near the patellar tendon can predispose to a patellar tendon rupture, which is a disaster. So that's an area where that's an option that we generally don't have. Uh, again, another option is uh, the use of anti-inflammatory medications such as Motrin or Advil or Aleve. Uh, another common knee problem is something called iliotibial band syndrome. Uh, it's usually pain on the outside part of the knee. Uh, just to give you some orientation here, this is a picture of the side of a leg. This is the buttocks. This is the thigh. Knees down here. And as this tendon, which starts up in the hip and inserts down below the knee, as you flex and extend your knee, this band here goes back and forth across the bony prominence of the bottom of the femur and causes irritation and friction. This is real common in runners. Uh, again, the treatment, stretching, a lot of these problems, uh, you just take a week off, they go away by themselves. Anti-inflammatory medication. Uh, this is a problem that frequently we prescribe orthotics. That's like a medial arch support or a Spenko or Dr. Scholl's that'll control the way your foot pronates or supinates, that's flat feet is a pronated foot. Uh, and, and that generally take care of it uh, very infrequently. Uh, if it's not responding to conservative treatments, there are surgical options, uh, either needling, going in with a needle and kind of breaking up some of the uh, inflammation of the tendon or surgically doing it. Again, we're talking about very, you know, one in a thousand at most people that would need some kind of treatment like that. So this is another uh, condition in the knee, like most things that we see that respond to some very simple, basic, conservative uh, measures. This is a picture of the ligaments on the knee. Uh, a strain is an injury to the uh, a tendon, a stretch injury to the tendon, and a sprain is an injury or stretch injury to a ligament. A ligament connects bone to bone. Again, most strains just resolve over the time. Sprains, it really depends on what ligament is involved. This ligament right in here, just again for perspective, this is the inside part of the knee. This is the outside part of the knee. This ligament here is called the medial collateral ligament. And if you get a uh, clipped playing football or some similar type injury, that can be torn. Depending on the severity of the injury, it may require just a little bit of rest. Generally, we brace it for a period of time, anywhere from three to six weeks, and they will heal. And in a very small percentage of patients, uh, it's fixed surgically. The ligaments on the inside part of the knee, the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament, primarily the anterior cruciate ligament, are a lot different. That, that ligament is in the inside of the knee. It's surrounded by the synovial fluid. So if it's torn, it will not heal. So this is a, a, a picture of how that injury occurs. Again, if you follow sports, you know, every third football, basketball player has this injury uh, during their career. Uh, it can be contact injury. It, more often than not, it's a non-contact injury where the foot is caught in something, the person twists and tears the ligament. Um, because of the differences in anatomy, women are more predisposed to this in men because the space available for the cruciate ligament is narrower and the angle of the femur uh, because the women's hips are a little bit wider, uh, is different. Women are now more predisposed in this, and uh, since now women are as involved in sports as men, we see we see a lot of females with this injury. It doesn't absolutely necessarily need to be fixed if you aren't very active, if you're older, if you don't have any significant impairment, it can be treated with some physical therapy and a brace. If you're more active, uh, if you're athletic, certainly, or if you're younger, we generally recommend fixing it, and that would involve surgery. Um, basically, what we do, uh, we can't fix the ligament per se. There's some experimental work being done in trying to actually get them to heal, but uh, for the most part, you have to take another ligament and put it in the place of the torn ligament. That's called an ACL reconstruction. Uh, one of the things that's relevant there is that because we're not fixing something, there's not any time constraints. In fact, we normally wait four to six weeks after the injury to let the swelling go down before we do the procedure. We have a person's patellar tendon with a little bit of bone or an allograft, which is a patellar tendon from 
uh, a cadaver, or some surgeons prefer to use a hamstring, and put that in the place of the ligament, attach it, and then we start patients moving right away. Uh, pro again, probably 20, 30% of uh, NFL players get this operation during some point in their career. It does take a while. Generally, you can get up and walk on it right away, but in terms of being able to participate in athletic activity, you're looking at nine months to a year recovery. That's why it's a season ending injury. Uh, again, this is just another picture of uh, how the graft goes in, and this is the hamstring that can be harvested. Again, some people use hamstrings. I tend to use patellar tendons, um, which is probably a majority of, of surgeons use, but there's pros and cons of both. And so that's a surgeon specific or a patient specific uh, decision that's made. Irrespective of how you treat this, it requires physical therapy and generally some period of bracing. Uh, I like to brace people for at least a year when they're involved in athletic activity, sometimes longer, uh, to prevent the ligament from being injured. Uh, I have to remind people that what we do is not as good as what Mother Nature did, and you managed to tear that ligament, so you certainly can tear this one. And there is a incidence of re-injury of that knee in people who go back to high-impact athletics. Very common uh, knee injury, the cause of knee pain or just tears. A meniscus is a piece of cartilage inside the knee that serves as a cushion that can get torn. A picture of a meniscus in between the femur and the tibia that's in the wrong place, causing the knee to lock or get stuck. It can also cause your knee to buckle or give way. Again, this is a picture of the anatomy of the knee. You've got the femur and the tibia, and you've got these two C-shaped cartilages here. And there's a picture of a little tear. The cartilage is not vascular, so you can't fix it. We generally go on and remove, with rare exceptions, just remove the small part of the cartilage that's torn. That's done arthroscopically, uh, generally under a local anesthetic with uh, maybe a sedative, so you're not actually uh, looking at the operation, although you can. Uh, it takes 15 to 20 minutes most of the time, uh, and we use a little fiber optic cable, so we're basically operating off of an image on a television screen. Uh, that's that's a, a diagnosis that's generally made first by the history. Uh, the pain is in a specific area. There's certain exams that we do, but our ability to definitively diagnose a meniscus tear is probably about 65%, which is not that great. So almost all the time, we will confirm it before operating by getting some something called an MRI. And this is a picture of uh, the, the meniscus. This is what it should look like, all black here. This white line is the tear, and the MRI is considered to be about 90 to 95% accurate, meaning five to 10% of the time it will either show something that looks like a tear that isn't, or more often doesn't show a tear, but when we look inside the knee, eventually there is one. Again, this is a picture of a, an arthroscopy. This is what it looks like through the camera. This is a small tear that's flipped out of position. This is the type of this is the type of tear surgeons like to see. We go in there. This takes about five minutes to fix. Patients get better immediately. They make us look great. These are the people that are out playing basketball two, three weeks after their operation. Uh, if you have a little bit of arthritis and some wear and tear and a meniscus tear, your recovery is going to be a little bit more prolonged and less traumatic. Um, but this is something that is amenable to being fixed. And then uh, the bulk of the talk is on treatment of knee arthritis. So the word arthritis means inflammation of the joint. Um, as a practical matter, what it refers to is a wearing away of the cartilage on the bottom of the femur and the top of the tibia. Uh, think about eating a chicken bone and that shiny edge of the chicken bone you see. Uh, picture sanding that down a little bit. Uh, that's what arthritis looks like. There are several Causes of arthritis, the most common is degenerative, it means it tends to occur as you get older. Some people are more genetically predisposed to that than others, uh, but it's fairly common as the older you get. Post-traumatic means you can have an injury that then leads to the development of arthritis. Back in the day when they used to take out the whole meniscus during uh, meniscal tears, they found that 10 years later, most people got arthritis. Uh, you can have a fracture, uh, any type of serious injury could predispose you to developing post-traumatic arthritis. Inflammatory arthritis, things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, psoriatic arthritis. Uh, these are the arthritis that you see all the commercials on television for that the pharmaceutical companies are selling the, the, the newer drugs for. 
And then infection, very uncommon, but infection in the knee is a surgical emergency because the um, bacteria can eat away at the cartilage and ruin the knee in, in 24 to 48 hours. So this is a picture of a normal knee x-ray. What we see is, this is the femur, this is the tibia, nice, clean, smooth lines on both sides with a clear space that is about the same all the way through and very clean and, uh, and not irregular. And this is a picture of a severely arthritic knee. You see, this is what people call bone on bone. The cartilage here is completely gone. The bone is rubbing on the bone. Picture sandpaper rubbing against sandpaper. You get grinding, you get pain, you get stiffness. This is narrow. You've got some bone spurs here. This little thing here is a bone spur. You've got what's called sclerosis, which is this whiteness here that gets um, more pronounced as the bone tries to protect itself. So this is a picture of a very severely arthritic knee. Symptoms of knee arthritis, pain, stiffness, deformity. If the knee wears out unevenly, if the inside part of the knee wears out more uh, quickly than the outside part, you start to get a deformity, either knock knee or bow legs, uh, they can progress. Instability means the knee gives out. It can uh, actually give way on you. And gait disturbance is a fancy term for a limp. Uh, it hurts when you walk, so you walk differently, uh, and that's what a limp is. So there's various ways to treat knee arthritis. And the first thing you need to understand is that you don't always need to treat it. There isn't always a great correlation between the amount of pain that somebody has and the severity of the arthritis on their x-ray. Some people are walking around with the crappiest looking x-rays. You can't understand how they could be doing well, and they're playing tennis. And they don't have any pain, and we happen to get an x-ray for some other reason. Other people have x-rays that, that don't look that bad, but they seem to have a lot of discomfort. So uh, the need for treatment is based not just on the diagnosis and the x-rays, but on the basis of what the individual is complaining about and what their goals are. Uh, so people figure this out on their own, but one of the first things that people oftentimes do is they, they offload the weight on the knee. Uh, they'll use the cane. And for people who don't know this, the, at least academically, the correct way to use a cane is to put it in the opposite hand of the painful knee so that your weight shifts off of that leg. In more severe cases, use a walker. Uh, again, a walker will allow you to take more weight off the knee. It'll also provide you with stability. People that have arthritis in both knees, again, sometimes as people get older, they not only have arthritis, but they have some other medical conditions. They might have a mild uh, case of Parkinson's. They may have just generalized mus muscular weakness. They have some balance issues. So a cane or a walker, probably more a walker, is a great way of making sure that a bad knee doesn't end you in the hospital with a broken hip. And in general, if you're having a lot of pain and you're limping a lot until you're able to get medical treatment, using one of those two is, a, is an excellent idea. So one of the things that we talk about to people all the time is weight loss. Um, in America, you know, everybody's overweight for the most part, uh, but there are clear evidence that the heavier you are, the more likely you are to develop arthritis. And in the last couple of years, uh, there are actually guidelines now that if you, you need to have surgery, like a knee replacement or hip replacement, there's actually a cutoff that we use. It's called BMI. Uh, that's a function of your height and your weight, where if you're above a certain amount, we really aren't supposed to be doing the surgery. Uh, if you have a BMI of over 40, well, let's put it in perspective. If your BMI is 30, that's obese. If you have a BMI over 40, the incidence of wound complications and things like that are much higher. If you have a BMI over 50, the incidence of wound complications is off the chart. So most hospitals won't allow you to have the surgery with the BMI over 50, and most surgeons will not do it unless their BMI is under 40. Obviously, the less the better. 